Reading this evening, the Epistle of Paul to the Philippians in chapter 3. Philippians in chapter 3. Let's hear the word of God. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained, or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that you have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example And note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to us tonight. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? The great 18th century Welsh preacher Daniel Rowland used to say that legality, that is the belief, the idea that we can work our way to heaven, that we can earn and merit our salvation. Legality, he said, is like a man's shirt. It's the first thing we put on, and it's the last thing that we put off. One of the great obstacles to people becoming Christians 
is the belief that we are not helpless and that we are not hopeless sinners who need the Lord Jesus Christ to save us. The fact is that we think that we are self-sufficient and the idea is expressed by people in, in many ways. I don't need to go to church, people say. Why not? The person who says that believes themselves to be all right. I already have faith, someone says. And again, the person who says that believes then that they must be all right. Christians are all hypocrites anyway. And by inference, they are not. So they must be all right. Oh, I say my prayers. and Sometimes I read the Bible too. And so they are all right. I enjoy songs of praise on the television. I love those old hymns that people sing. So you're all right. Oh, I believe in God. There's someone up there above looking after me. I'm sure of it. So it's all all right. Well, those are just some of the things that you will have heard people say many times. And people who say things like that have not yet grasped that they are helpless, hopeless sinners who need to be saved by Christ. They don't know who God is, and they don't know what God is like. They don't know what God expects of them. Neither, neither do they know what they themselves are like. Otherwise, they would not speak as they do. They simply haven't seen that in God's eyes, they are rebels. They're self-centered. They're unable to please God, and they need to be saved. They just have not seen that and recognized that. And you can discover that very simply by asking uh, a person what they actually think of the words of some of those old hymns that they find so helpful. Often on songs of praise, they will sing, Jesus, lover of my soul. Well, there's a line in that hymn that puts us on the spot. Charles Wesley, the author, wrote, Foul and full of sin I am. Do you believe that? Do you believe that about yourself? We may say to, of someone, well, he's such a lovely person. He's a nice man. But you see, when we begin to measure ourselves by God's standard, we see that, well, the reality is a totally different story because measured against God's standard, what we say is good and lovely really isn't the case at all. We see that everyone falls and fails. We all fall short. For example, people who say, I don't need to go to church. Well, are they spending Sunday, the Lord's Day at home, praising and worshipping Almighty God? Is that what they're doing on God's Day? People who say, I have faith, I already have faith, do they trust God every day for everything? People who say, Christians, these people are just hypocrites, are they themselves single-mindedly holy? People who say, I pray and I read the Bible, do they really pray? to the Almighty God in adoration and worship and intercession, and the Bible, is it really the most precious thing they possess so that if it came to a choice between the television and the Bible that they would choose the Bible? Do they really love God's Word? People who love to sing hymns when they're on the television or the radio, do they believe the words of the hymns that they supposedly sing? People who say they believe that there's someone up there looking after them, do they love the God who protects them and the God who provides for them? In other words, you see, when we begin to ask questions like this, we begin to see that mostly what people say and what they profess about themselves are just hollow, shallow, empty words. When it comes to actually loving the God we profess to believe, our love is scarcely visible, if visible at all. Now, becoming a Christian doesn't begin until we realize these things. That we do not love God with heart and soul and mind and strength, and certainly that we don't love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And that's a very bitter pill for people to swallow, to realize that you simply 
cannot do what God requires of you. You cannot keep his law. You have no righteousness of your own. You are spiritually bankrupt. That's a very unpleasant thing to realize. I imagine that it's a painful thing, an unpleasant and a humiliating thing, to be declared bankrupt economically. That must be a hard thing to bear. But it's far more bitter to be declared spiritually bankrupt. We, we find that is very difficult for people to accept, to say that we are condemned by the God that we spend our lives ignoring and that we fall because of that under his judgment and condemnation. You see, the God who is just demands that we be condemned because we're criminals before the bar of divine justice. And becoming a Christian doesn't begin until you realize that, that you cannot keep God's law, that you deserve the condemnation of God's law, so that we're constrained by that to believe the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, which is that this God who is above us as our judge has loved us, that he has given his son for us and that his son has done for us what God requires us to do. He loved the Father and obeyed his will and law. He lived the completely righteous life that we never could and he for us has given up that righteous life to God that he might credit it to us if we believe. And in giving up his life to God, Jesus Christ has at the same time Born the condemnation that ought justly have been received by us. He has carried the punishment that we deserve. And he, the just, died instead of us, the unjust, to bring us to God. And he offers now a full and a free pardon for all of our sins. And if we know that we cannot keep the law of God and that we are spiritually bankrupt, then we are glad to come to someone who has limitless spiritual wealth and who is able and willing to give that to us his righteousness if we know that we are condemned and we have no merit before God and deserve to die because of our sins then what an amazing joy it is to realize that somebody someone else has died in our place instead of us for us now that's what it is to become a Christian it is to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done for us, and not to believe in and not to trust anything that we might have done to save us. That's the message that the Apostle Paul preached everywhere he went. Jesus Christ and him crucified. He publicly placarded, portrayed him, speaking to people always about Christ and about his cross and his death, taking away our guilt, making us acceptable to God in Christ Jesus. Now Paul preached this message, and these Galatian Christians to whom he writes this, this letter, this epistle, had believed that message. They had believed in Jesus Christ. They heard that message in faith, and so they were saved. They were forgiven. When they became Christians, that is what happened to them. And when we become Christians, that is what happens to us. We look away from ourselves, away from our works, away from all our church going and our religious activities and privileges, and we put all our trust in Jesus Christ alone. So we turn our backs upon all our privileges and achievements and advantage and attainment, and we rely on Jesus alone. That's what Paul was saying in the passage we read a little earlier from Philippians 3, where he lists all of his advantages and all of his achievements, and he says, I regard them all now as rubbish. I, I've turned away from relying upon them, and now I rely upon Jesus Christ and upon Christ alone. And when we put our trust in Jesus Christ alone, something quite miraculous happens. We receive the Holy Spirit. When we believe the gospel, when we believe this message concerning Jesus Christ and him crucified, we receive the Holy Spirit. The blessings of salvation are given to those who believe in Jesus 
And it is the Holy Spirit who brings those blessings of salvation to us. When we believe in Christ, the Holy Spirit opens our eyes so that we see the spiritual realities that are there to be seen. And the Holy Spirit not only opens our eyes, but he also assures us of our salvation. He assures us that God has accepted us and that we are his children, that we belong to him. And the Holy Spirit gives us an appreciation for the person of our Lord Jesus Christ that we never had before, so that we know he is the Savior and that he is our Savior. And the Holy Spirit enables us to love God and to serve God, and he empowers us to live for God. He gives us new motives, new interests, new desires, new ambitions, and we just we begin to see just how hollow and how shallow life is without the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the things revealed in God's Word to be ultimately important, the most important things in life. The Holy Spirit is given to us. He opens our eyes. He enlarges our hearts so that we receive all these blessings of salvation. And as we believe in Christ, so the Holy Spirit comes. And he distributes these blessings of salvation to those who believe. So, so to people who believe in Jesus and only to them, the gift of the Spirit is given, who gives then the blessings of salvation to the people of God. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's how it all begins. And Paul reminds these believers here of that. Are you so foolish? He says, having begun in the Spirit. That's how they began, by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit given to them, bringing salvation to them when they heard and believed the gospel concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how it begins. And now Paul is stressing that is how it is to continue after you've become a Christian. Things aren't to change after conversion. We don't afterward rely upon what we are doing for Jesus Christ for acceptance. We, we aren't to depend in the least upon what we do for Jesus Christ. These Galatians, you see, these Christians in Galatia had come to believe that they were to continue to depend upon Jesus Christ, but also they were to depend upon certain works for him. Verse 3, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? Are we perfected by the flesh, by the works of the flesh? That's what these Galatian Christians had been led to believe. They had understood that up to the moment of putting faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, their works, the very best of them, availed nothing before God, but that faith in Jesus Christ was the only thing that mattered. It was sufficient, because that is what God required. But now they're being told by false teachers who've infiltrated the church there that faith in Jesus Christ was not sufficient, but that they must also rely on their own obedience to God's law. And in particular, they must submit to the right of circumcision, they were taught. Now Paul refers here to the works of the law, and he refers to the flesh. And when Paul writes of the flesh here, he doesn't mean sinful passions, sensual, sinful desires. That's not what he's talking about, as he does in other parts of the Scripture. He doesn't mean that at all here. When he says the flesh here, he simply means human works. And he includes that in that religious human works. Circumcision. There's nothing wrong with circumcision in and of itself. But flesh here means attempts to live the Christian life in our own energy. Attempts to work for Christ. Attempts to preach. The flesh here means human works. Religious rituals. Attempts to think spiritually, to love, to serve by our own effort, our own strength, and without any reliance upon God the Holy Spirit. And Paul writes of the works of the law and of the flesh. He means our efforts, our service, things that we are doing for Jesus Christ. But they're things that we ourselves begin to look at 
and take pride in and begin to rely upon. Now let's be clear here. Works really do matter in the Christian life. The letter of James reminds us very powerfully that faith without works is dead. Circumcision in and of itself was a natural thing. There's nothing wrong with it. A secondary matter entirely. But these Galatians, these Christians in Galatia, were being told to depend upon circumcision. They were being told that it wasn't enough now to look to Jesus Christ for salvation, but they also had to be circumcised. And so circumcision became part of the ground upon which their faith had to be based So no longer were their eyes upon Jesus Christ, but they were also fixing their eyes upon their circumcision. And they were relying upon that for peace with God. And so we need to understand clearly what Paul is talking about here. He's not talking about works, good works in and of themselves, because clearly works are important in the Christian life. They flow, as we saw previously, they flow from a life of living faith in Jesus Christ. But he's talking here about the danger of looking to your own works and resting upon your own works instead of looking to and resting upon Jesus Christ alone. Now, you might think that this is not something that you are guilty of or that you could be guilty of. But I'm not so sure. Paul puts three questions to us here. And the three questions show us that it is all too possible for a true Christian to become like these Christians at Galatia. Are you so foolish, he says in verse 3, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? When you began, it was by the Spirit. Are you now being perfected by the flesh, beginning by the Spirit, But in going on, the flesh intrudes. And you begin to rely upon your works and upon what you are doing as a Christian. They had heard of Jesus Christ and him crucified. They had realized they had no true righteousness of their own. They believed in Jesus Christ. They received the Holy Spirit. But what now? What now? Were they still looking to Jesus Christ alone? Still relying upon Jesus Christ alone? Or were they beginning to rely a little bit on themselves too? Take a preacher, someone who wants to be a preacher. Why does he want to be a preacher? Why? Well, it may be that he enjoys preaching. That he loves it. That he lives for it. It's important to him. But why? Why? Well, it may be because the very act of preaching gives him enormous pleasure. The image of a preacher appeals to him. He loves to preach. But does he love the Lord? And where is his real trust? Where is his real interest? Is it the Lord and the Lord's people? Or is it preaching? And being a preacher, where is he looking? Where are his eyes fixed and focused? Are they upon himself and upon his preaching? Or are his eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, so that he's not thinking about himself at all? You see, it is conceivably perfectly possible for a man to be enjoying himself completely in the pulpit, but that is not what he's meant to be doing at all. He's meant to be glorifying God. It's got nothing to do with him. And that applies to any and every kind of Christian service. God is to be glorified in it. And yet it's possible for the focus to be entirely upon ourselves in any kind of Christian service that we might be engaged in. We use our gifts in Christian service. We have our place in the church. We make our contribution. We bring our money and we fulfill our role. And we have the things that we do Thank God. We should thank God for opportunities to serve him. But it's possible for us to come to rely in part and even in the whole upon what we are doing. 
our contribution, our gifts, our name, our money, our membership, or whatever it is. And that's a very great danger. Why do we continue in the Christian life? Why do we come to church? Why do we pray? Why teach and preach the word of God? Why do we give? Why do we get involved in the course of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it's possible to do those things just because you enjoy them, because you're a religious type of person. And because they give us pleasure and a sense of satisfaction. And therefore, rather than looking to the Lord himself, we're looking at ourselves and our activity and our enjoyment of those things. Beginning with the Spirit, we are seeking perfection by the flesh. At the beginning we said, nothing in my hands I bring. But now, our hands are full. Beginning in the Spirit, we are to continue in the Spirit. Our eyes are to be constantly looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. Constantly looking to him. Constantly realizing that the grace and the power to serve the Lord comes from the Lord. So we must be God-focused and Christ-centered. Why do we get involved in the church? What comes first for you? Our involvement or Christ? Us or the church? What comes first? You? What you want? Or the good of the church, the people of God and the cause of Christ? Too often, you see, for too many people, commitment to the church, well, it depends on their involvement. And so they're committed only if they've got some recognized position or rank or task. But if they haven't got that, well, they don't need to be com committed. They're not really interested. Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? How foolish. There's a subtle danger in relying, you see, upon our own works and activity in the church. Important though those things are, of course. But relying on them, putting our confidence in them, Trusting in them, in those things, rather than in Christ. And then he brings a second question in verse 4. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? The word suffering there uh, is probably better translated experienced. And that could be then experienced sufferings or experienced favors. In other words, God has been with you. You have suffered, and God has helped you through those things. Why did God do that? God has been favorable to you in your life in many ways. He has cared for you providentially. He has overruled countless of your mistakes, helping you, comforting you, empowering you. He has blessed you. You've experienced these many things. Did you experience them in vain? Were you really thinking all along that these favours that God was showing you, the help he gave you, that they were all somehow or another a reward for your good works and your faithfulness? Do you think that it was because of your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ that you received these favours? that it was because of your loyalty to him and your commitment and your faithfulness, that because of that, God was just rewarding you? Do you think that these favors were deserved? That you've earned them? That you should expect no less of God after all that you've done? Well, if you think like that, you have completely misunderstood the situation, completely misinterpreted things. Your eyes have been taken from Christ, you see, and put on yourself, and you mistakenly think that God now is rewarding you because of what you are doing. And so it is upon your own merit you are relying. Well, have you received, have you experienced these many things in vain, all God's comforts and favor and the grace you've received? Were they all in vain? Was it really all part and parcel of a self-centered life? Self-reliance? Because if so, it is in vain. It's all for nothing. 
But then Paul adds those words, if indeed it was in vain. In other words, he's holding out for us a hope of a change in heart. He says, it, it may not. It may not have been in vain. Don't. Don't rely upon the fact that you believe God is rewarding you because of your commitment to him, that he has blessed you and helped you in time of trouble because you've loved and trusted him. Don't do that. You go on trusting in him. Go on believing in him. Put all of your confidence in Christ. Stop looking at yourself. Stop looking at your works. And then he asks that third question in verse 5. And interestingly, he uses the present tense, doesn't he? He who supplies the Spirit to you. The Spirit is constantly supplied to the church. It's not just at conversion that the Spirit is given. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? The continuing provision of the Holy Spirit and in New Testament times, the gifts of miracles that came with the Spirit. Why did God continue to provide the Spirit? Why does God, why did God continue to work these miracles among New Testament believers? Why did he do that? Did he do it because of all their abilities and all their achievements? Was, was this a reward for what they had done? He who does these things, is it done by the works of the law? Is it because of their obedience and their commitment? Or is it because you hear and believe, he says? You see, these things are given as a response to faith. Faith in Christ. It's not a reward of what we do. We, we are meant to engage in the service of God in God's kingdom. We are meant to be serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith is meant to to produce works, but we're not meant to rely upon our works. We're not to rely upon them as though somehow God is rewarding us for all that we are doing for him. We didn't think like that when we were converted, did we? So how is it that you come to believe and to think like that now? That's the kind of thing that Paul is driving at here. You began in the Spirit but now you're trying to be perfected by the flesh. You are focusing on yourself. You're focusing upon what you're doing. Your involvement and your place in the church and your commitment to the things of God and your service of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your focus is all wrong, he's saying to the church. There. Your focus is to be on Christ, serving him, loving him, trusting him. The Holy Spirit is given to humble, dependent believers, not to people who parade their gifts, not to people who want to be congratulated, not to people who want to be noticed and who are full of themselves. That, you see, is a prostitution of Christianity, and there's a great deal of it going on today. Man-centered, self-centered, works-centered Christianity, my activities, my work in the church, my involvement, my gifts being seen, my abilities being appreciated, my contribution to the work. A church can be bursting with activity. And yet Christ and the Spirit can be completely absent. Far too much of evangelicalism today is characterized by arrogant, self-centered people parading themselves before Almighty God. And Paul has written this letter to demolish that to get rid of it, because it's an offense to God. It's an abomination to him. He loathes it. Our works, our activities, all of our commitment and our righteousness, who do we think we are and who do we think we're dealing with? I'll tell you who we are. Hopeless, helpless, wretched sinners utterly dependent upon the grace of a sovereign saviour. That's who we are. But we don't really believe it. We don't put it into practice. We sing the hymns, a debtor to mercy alone we sing, a wonderful hymn we say, 
And then someone fails to notice us and fails to thank us for some good deed we've done and we are peeved and we sulk. Someone hasn't asked me to do whatever it is and I feel depressed and cast down. No. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? What are you living for? What are your eyes upon? It's just what the Apostle Paul was talking about in Philippians 3. Whatever was to my profit, my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have suffered the loss of all things, all his achievements, all his ability, all his false hopes, all his trusts, He's lost all. I consider it all rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own which comes by the law, but that which is by faith in Christ. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be made conformable to him in his death. One thing I do, forgetting those things which lie behind, straining forward for what is ahead, I press toward the goal, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That is how to think, says Paul. You who are mature, join me in thinking like this. So our confidence in the end, you see, ultimately, as in the beginning of the Christian life, is to be on our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. We're not to rely upon our works. We're not to rely upon our preaching. If the, preaching puts his, if the preacher puts his confidence in his preaching, if he just enjoys preaching, then he is totally deluded. The whole of the Christian life is to be lived in the enjoyment of Christ and in serving Christ in the way he commands us to serve him. But if we're relying on our activities, if I'm relying upon my preaching... Well, what will happen to me? Well, I may find myself a castaway. In the end, it is Christ and Christ alone we are to rely upon and to serve him and to honour him, to commit ourselves to him, to live for his glory. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me.